Welcome back to another episode of the Shared Practices Podcast. As you heard in the outro of last episode, uh, this is just me today. Uh, this is almost like a bridge episode between Season 2 and Season 3. There was an episode that I wanted to squeeze into Season 2, but uh, as you guys probably heard in the outro yesterday, or yesterday, last week's episode, uh, Richard is uh, going to take a break for Season 3, and he's going to uh, check out, finish up his residency, and get everything sorted out so he can come back Season 4 um, better than ever. And I'm going to have a new co-host um, in Season 3, uh, a good friend of mine, actually the individual that introduced Richard and I. Um, so that'll be coming up next week. Uh, this week I had an episode I wanted to squeeze into Season 2, um, but it couldn't quite make it work with Richard's timeline. And so I wanted to have on a James Bachmeyer, who is the CEO of a really cool, like one of the hottest companies in um, you know dental lending. Um, they are a tech startup almost. I mean, he was calling me. We had the we we talked uh, from his office in San Francisco. I mean, couldn't be any more tech startup like. Um, but I think lending is very important. And so I know I talked about it on the podcast already about a year ago, almost a year ago. And so I wanted to have him back on because I think some of the things they're doing are interesting and really uh, valuable to buyers, maybe more than people may realize. And so I wanted to have Mon talk about his company. And I am in general just, uh, I like, you know, tech startups. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd. And so towards the end of the episode, I kind of talk about his business model and their strategy and whatnot. And so I think it's a great episode. I encourage you guys to uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Um, and we'll go ahead and jump right to the interview with James Bachmeyer. I have with me here today, James Bachmeyer. And I'm really excited for today's episode. I think he's doing some really cool things in the uh, dental lending space. And so I wanted to have him on the podcast to talk about them. And so, James, how are you doing today? I'm great, George. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. And I wanted to go ahead and give you a chance to introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, so why don't you just start telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, and then we'll start talking about your company. Sure. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate it, George. Uh, well, my name is James Bachmeyer, like you said, and I am a founder of a, te- of a company called Lendever, and we're related to the dental space because we are a model- modern technology-enabled lender to, for healthcare practices. We provide financing for practices in real estate up to $5 million, and as far as my background, uh, I come from St. Paul, Minnesota. We are, you know, while we're a tech company based in San Francisco, you know, the, the, the mecca of tech, you know, in, in Silicon Valley here. I come from Minnesota, as is my co-founder, actually, Daniel Pickham. Uh, so we're a very close-knit company with a lot of down-home, down-home Midwesterners. I grew up in Minnesota, like I said, played sports there and went to grade school, college all the way through law school or went to the University of Minnesota. And uh, my good friend, Dan Pickham, uh, was working private equity in uh, New York. And we just had always a, a lot of interest in going into business together and particularly had a lot of interest in what was happening with technology, uh, especially along on the West Coast. And we uh, had a family member of his that sort of pointed us in the right direction in, in the small business space. We saw a lot of you know, exciting new uh, you know, technology lenders that were emerging, and, and we thought it was a great space to, to get into. And you did, and, and eventually found our, our niche uh, here in the healthcare space. So, tell me a little about your like background as a lawyer. So, did you guys do? Did you do like lendal, or sorry, dental specific law, or were you just more of a general lawyer? Sure, no, that's a, a great question. So, my my experience as a, as a lawyer was pretty short lived because I left to for the West Coast to start Lendever only about six months six months into having my legal license. I got I finished at the University of Minnesota. Most of the work that I did was actually criminal law totally unrelated to dental. And there are, were really incredible stories, some sad, some funny, uh, always very entertaining. And I had a, you know, a, an opportunity to, to work at a large firm. I also had an opportunity to work for a really great lawyer in Minnesota who did criminal work, a gentleman by the name of Earl Gray. And it was really exciting because we worked with you know, several of the Minnesota Vikings. And I don't know if you're actually familiar with the Philando Castillo case. He was uh, the defense attorney there, which was a widely known one of those shooting cases actually fairly recently. And it was all that was really exciting to me as was the idea of going in business with business with my friend. And, and I was actually in, in a band for two years before I started law school. So I have, I've kind of hit my toes in a lot of really exciting things. And honestly, to me, the hard thing in life has always been deciding what not to do. You know, a lot of people are like, Oh, what am I going to do? I thought this all sounded really fun. And then when I finished law school, you know, like I mentioned, I had those, those opportunities to, to whether it was, you know, going into to, to small practice with, with the criminal law or, the, or that larger firm. I also was thinking about going to Nashville uh, and taking another shot at music. I said, hey, you know, this is the one time I don't have kids. I don't have a family and I can go be silly and take some risks. 
and hopefully have some fun, be successful uh, as well. Uh, and that was also, though, when my good buddy Dan Tickham was in New York and called me and, and, and finally, you know, we'd always pass around the idea of getting into business and, you know, pass around some ideas. And he said, hey, man, I'm, I'm ready. Let's do this thing. And uh, I said, hey, well, at, and, you know, I kind of ranked the things. I did a, a list of pros and cons on each of the opportunities. And I decided to do the, I was most interested in the craziest things. Those being going, in, going back into music or, or going out to uh, Silicon Valley and starting a technology company. I said, hey, if I'm going to be silly and take some risks, I might as well go do it with my best friend. And, and that's how it went out. But man, you know, like I said, a lot of things that, that I had gotten into the, you know, I was, I was considering going to the Naval Flight Program. I was accepted into the Navy JAG Program. All, those, it was a hard time just deciding what to do, but I'm really glad I, I, I decided to do this, man. It's a lot of fun. I get to come to work every day with my very best friends. Uh, I mentioned Dan Tickham, another gentleman who's our VP of operations here and really is, is kind of the hub cap of this thing and, and, and keeps us all together. I think uh, his name's Andrew Bennett. And I went to uh, grade school with Andrew, lived next door to him, played grade school baseball with him, high school baseball together. We played in the same college baseball team. He actually went on and played some minor league baseball as well. And when we were about a year into this thing, uh, I'd always, of course, stayed in touch with him because he's my other best friend. And he was also the smartest kid I knew, yeah, or, or the smartest person I knew. He's, he's a Putnam exam taker, which is, I think are some of the best mathematicians you'll find. He was a college math and physics professor. Uh, in addition to playing professional baseball. Um, so I always figured, hey, if there's a way I can get him on board, let's, let's do that. But anyways, he, he, he was silly enough to join us about a year in. And so I literally go to, I, I get to, you know, go to work every day with literally my two, my, my two best friends. So a lot of options, a lot of things I think I would have really enjoyed doing, but I can't imagine anything more fun uh, than the situation I'm, I'm in today. So tell me a little bit about uh, your, so what, I'm assuming that you guys, you and your uh, best buddy, Dan, decided to work together. And then you, you know, when you have a tech startup, you know, you're trying to think of what problem you're going to solve, right? So did you guys decide to work together first and then decide on healthcare finance? Is that kind of how it worked? Sure. Yeah. And it was, man, it was not, that, it wasn't really as smooth as you even just described, but it was an iterative process like that. So uh, he, Dan had a cousin named Port Cunningham, who was the CEO of a, a company called Yodel, which was uh, a small business marketing technology company. And they IPO'd and they were hugely successful. And he was, he pointed us in the direction of the small business lending because a lot of these new emerging small business lenders, I'll name a few like Lending Club, you know, they went public and had a big IPO, they, you know, had some struggles after that, but they're kind of one of the bigger names in the space. On Deck Capital is another name of, of, an, of one of these alternative lenders. SoFi is, is one that's doing a very, you know, a much more similar model to us, I think, in terms of, you know, they're, not, they're doing bank financing for folks. You know, they're, they're a $5 billion valued company today, or valued company today. But anyway, he kind of pointed us in the direction of, of those, and we we're like, hey, this is really interesting. That, you know, I'm a legal person. Dan's a, a finance person. There's a space in technology that we can kind of wrap our brains about. We're not going to get into, we're not going to get into AI or, or invent something uh, with a patent or something like that. That that wasn't our background. Financing was something we could wrap our brains around. And we, and we kind of saw this, this growth in the space. We're like, hey, that's that's really interesting. No, you know, no understanding or I wouldn't, I wouldn't say not a lack of interest but no understanding of health care we didn't know that dental lending existed at that point we get into this space and you know we, we think oh, you know let's let instead of just trying to become one of these lenders let's learn about them and and become let's be Expedia for small business loans or kayak for small business loans and we'll kind of see how we'll get to learn this space a lot more and we did that we realized customer acquisition was really hard <laughs> I think we tried an AdWords campaign and, a, and an SEO campaign that you know, we, we spent, you know, 50 or $70,000 on, we practically goose egged. And then we, we kind of stumbled into healthcare. We literally, we literally did. And we, you know, we stumbled into a deal or two, I think. And, and we started kind of understanding that healthcare practitioners are folks who were, were launched into business ownership and they, you know, but they didn't get any business training. So, so a lot of them were working with advisors, with trusted advisors very closely. And we got to know, uh, you know, some folks like that, that that worked with dentists and we realized, Hey, you know, this is a space where we can understand customer acquisition. You know, you go out there, you prove if, and if you can service the needs of the clients of these people that are working with dentists on a consistent, on a consistent basis, you can continue to acquire customers. So we're like, okay, we figured out customer acquisition. Let's go to healthcare. That, that's, a, that's something that makes sense about it. That's something that makes sense to us rather. Then, you know, we, we were kind of doing that intermediary thing or that intermediary role, if you will. And, and we realized very quickly, number one, there wasn't really a need for alternatives. Most of this space, you know, is, is very highly qualified. And, and the, the lenders that can provide that financing were banks. 
And uh, while some of them were interested in working with us, the integration was just very clunky. You know, we had, we had all this time, we were building this great software. We had this gentleman uh, named Darren Boyd, Darren Boyd and a third co-founder named, named Drew Warehouse on our team who were working on the technical side with us. And we were building a beautiful software uh, all this time. But we realized that it was just really hard to, to integrate with, with bank partners. Um, they, they were just, you know, they're good people there and all that, but they were just so mired in bureaucracy and, and, and regulation. It was very hard for them to work with somebody like us and to make it a cohesive experience for the customer. So James, uh, let me just quickly so, ask you, yeah. so your initial model then, so how long ago did you guys decide to get into healthcare? Jeez, almost three years ago. Um, so, so, so became operational in 2014 and, and, and quickly pivoted into healthcare during 2015. But yes, go, go on with your question. So then you guys were initially, your initial model was that uh, you would acquire customers and then you would kind of like a, uh, a loan broker, so to speak, then that you guys would facilitate the loan experience with a bigger bank. And then that's how you guys would do it using your software. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. But in, in the value of our software was initially, so we understood that there, there was some difference in what different banks were looking for. So our initial goal is to help people evaluate where they should go for their loan. Okay. And then also try to help them collect information and documentation in a way that's more efficient than it might be if they worked with that bank directly. So you um, wanted so, to so like... The, you know, Somebody uploads their practice to your website, they upload all of their information, and then you spit out like each bank, what rate they'll get, and then you can send them to whatever bank is best for them. Is that correct? You're correct. And we try to help them, guide, we help guide them through the, the, you know, the, the approval process with that bank. And as you might imagine, you know, we had a slick software getting all the information that they needed for the bank. But the bank could needed to do they needed them to do the application all over again. They couldn't accept what we had been uh, what we'd been putting together. So it was it was you know it was frustrating. We we just couldn't integrate with them the way that we had hoped. And we said, hey, like, how about we how about we control this process ourselves? Kind of that like Apple end to end thing. We're really gonna if we're you know sit around here and, and we want to make process better for folks, we need to control the experience for them end to end. They can, we can't hand it off to anybody at any point. Uh, and that was a you know a, a tough realization because it meant. We needed to change our business model to lending and, and raise a heck of a lot of money. But we were very fortunate. We were, success, we were very successful on that front as well. But man, that's a dramatic change going from, from brokering to, to lending, especially loans of the size that are in the practice uh, finance industry. So now you guys directly lend to, to buyers who are looking to buy practices from your own you know, raised capital. Is that correct? You're correct. So that, so that is a long gone business model. There's absolutely, we, are not an, we are not a broker. We are a direct lender. Uh, a licensed lender. And uh, yes, we provide direct loans to healthcare practices up to $5 million for, pra- for their practices and for real estate. And the great thing now is we control the process all the way to funding and we service the relationship as well and help, help folks with all their additional financing needs. Really what, we like, what we're trying to become today is, is the modern bank uh, for healthcare practitioners. So James, um, let me quickly. Um, yeah. So I'm currently in the process, in the thick of the process of getting my loan for, mm-hmm. for my practice acquisition. And in your case, so I, I, I see the value in what you guys do differently. Uh, but for our listener out there who maybe doesn't necessarily see like what's broken about the current model. So, you know, what problem to help maybe somebody who doesn't necessarily feel the, uh, the pain that um, may be out there, you know, what problem is Lendever solving? You know, like what, what, what is the issue with the current paradigm with other lenders out there that you guys feel is out there? Sure. It's, it's efficiency and speed. And, and that's what the technology enables us to do. So basically, we're taking a paper process and we're bringing it online to a really smooth dashboard. And what it means at the end of the day is instead of emailing PDFs and, and different tax returns and scanning them and, and printing them off and going back and forth, which often can take weeks at a time, uh, you're logging into a really select dashboard of ours and completing an application within a day and, and you're being formally approved in, within a couple of days. So what it, what it means for the doctor at the end of the day is you're spending a heck of a lot less time on the application itself, many, many, like far, far fewer hours on an application. So it's less time overall. And you also have the ability to move more quickly. Not everybody's looking to fund tomorrow or, or in a month from now. But the really cool thing about us is you can fund a practice, a million dollar practice loan in a week. We have actually achieved that. We have funded a real estate loan in 23 days. And the market average for these types of loans is over a month for a practice loan and three or four months for a real estate loan. So basically, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're, we have timelines and days that are taking our competitors weeks, and we have uh, things that take us weeks that take our competitors months. 
So, and part of that is the technology. And that, not, that allows us to be far more nimble and provide a more personal and better experience. And at the end of the day, we don't have layers of bureaucracy behind us where there's four or five different organizations or people or underwriters or credit folks signing off on the same thing and all looking at it very differently, creating a kind of Frankenstein lending policy. So again, efficiency and speed at the end of the day, the doctor's time or is, is, a doctor's time is extremely valuable as we all know. Uh, and we're going to take a heck of a lot, a lot less of it. And then uh, the other thing I would add is, is, is some funding certainty. So some of the cool things our technology has enabled us to do and our, and our focus on process has enabled us to do is weed out the things that have no business kind of letting everybody down at the end of the day. Like one example might be, are you a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident of the United States? That's something that we're getting in our pre-qualification in, in about 10 minutes. That's something that a legal department of a bank might not figure out until somebody is one or two months into a, into a loan. And, and, that, and if you think of a transition loan, you have a buying and a selling party and a lot of advisors who put a lot of work into this thing. Uh, so a heck of a lot of heartbreak uh, when you find out that you can't do a deal uh, because somebody you know, doesn't have permanent status or something like that, or another, maybe there's something maybe there's something wrong with their healthcare license that, that's putting it in jeopardy. These are things that are really easy to figure out uh, quickly if you have technology, but you're going to make a lot of mistakes uh, if you don't have that. So uh, the other thing I would add is peace of mind, uh, in addition to the efficiency and speed. So what do you mean by peace of mind? Sure. So so basically, when you have it, when you're pre-qualified or you're approved with us up front. You're just a heck of a lot less. You're, a heck of, you're because we are, are thorough and getting those things out of the way that that could be and that have no business being an issue down the road. You, you, your your likelihood of funding is just much higher. So, and for example, you, you get a, you get an approval from from a, a, another lender in the space. You might feel great about it and all that, but the fact that sometimes there are little things that they have not checked that can that can become a deal breaker one or two months into the road. And it's just far more heartbreaking when you put all that work in and, and something that simple becomes a, a deal killer and, and it's not for us. And the reason, the way that we're doing that is we've invented this product called the, pre, the Lendever pre-qualification. And what that is, so you mentioned you're, you're, the, you're the dentist that wants to acquire a practice. And we've taken all the things on, on the buyer side that are, are you know, vitally important and we've, put, we've, and we've assembled them in a single 10 to 15 minute form that you fill out. Like I said, we call it the, the pre-qualification. So what we do, what we ask there is we figure out what kind of a producer you are. Can you, know, can you replace the production that's leaving the practice. We figure out what your personal financial situation is. We do a soft credit pool. We're the only lender in the space that does a soft credit pool. So you can inquire with us without any ding to your credit uh, or, or, or without any uh, inquiry on your credit or resulting ding to your score. Are you familiar with that, George? You can, you can, if you apply and you get a hard credit pool somewhere that that can affect your credit score. Yeah, I am. But can you explain that to our audience? Because I think that's important to, it's an important distinction. Sure, absolutely. So if I'm doing a hard credit pull with, with a lender and I apply and they pull and I give them an authorization to pull my credit, you do it, you know, you do a squiggly line on the, on the application and they, and they go and they pull their credit. What happens is it will show that lender A made an inquiry on your credit report. And inquiries are, are this just a list at the bottom of, of your credit report. Then maybe lender C made an inquiry and lender G made an inquiry. If you add up, you know, when you start adding up, especially three inquiries in a short amount of time, what the, what, and this is, you know, the, the, the various bureaus, this is sort of a black box, but one of the things that you can definitely predict are that they're going to bring your score down a little bit. If you're going around for credit, uh, you know, these, these people who kind of determine what these scores are and, and check a lot of places, they've decided that you're, you've become less credit worthy. I'm not saying I agree with that, but that's the way that the system works. Um, the cool thing about us is we think that's pretty, not only do we not agree with that, we think it's silly. Um, so we give the folks the opportunity to, to do a soft credit pull with us. That's, that's a different product that we use. We get all the same exact information. We know exactly where you stand. Your, your evaluation is, is no less you know, final than, or, or thorough than a hard pull, but it doesn't have that inquiry on your report. It doesn't say that we'll never check your credit. And as a result, you've shopped with us, and it costs you nothing. Up next, a word from our sponsor, Q Optics. I love Q-Optics loops to the point where I reached out to them and asked them if they wanted to sponsor season one of my podcast. The first time I put on their loops, I thought to myself, why can't everyone do this? Why can't everyone nail my angle of declination that I want? And the only reservation I had about Q-Optics was that their magnification couldn't go high enough for what I wanted. Well, I am proud to announce that Q-Optics now offers an expanded line of their prismatic loops 
So you can go all the way from 2.5 to 3 to 3.5, 4, all the way up to 4.5 in their same frame that everyone loves. This is awesome because every other Loops company that I've used in the past has always said, oh, well, yeah, we can do 4 or 4.5, but not in that frame. We, we have to go up to this other frame that isn't as ergonomic and we can't push the angle of declination. And after three weeks of using it, my neck's hurting. I'm like, what's the point of using loops if my neck hurts? And I love more magnification. I love being able to see that big cartoon tooth of four and a half X and just know that my margin is, is, is money because I can feel and see it. Oh, and did I mention they're through the lens? This is no flip down, flip up, whatever you want to call it. These bad boys aren't going anywhere. If you are ready to upgrade both your magnification and your ergonomics, you can email sales at q-optics.com with the promo code SP16 for $100 off of the loops alone or $300 off a loop and light combo for our podcast listeners only. That's SP as in shared practices 16 to sales at qoptics.com. It's time to have the best of both worlds. So you're allowing it buyers, you know, because I think that's part of the, uh, you know, apprehensive nature that people have is, you know, the bank already pulled their credit. And so they don't want to, you know, potentially get a better rate with another bank because they don't want to risk the credit pool. So then you're pretty much allowing people to do that, get a second opinion, so to speak, uh, without actually having a, you know, a hit on their credit. Am I understanding that correctly? That's a, you're absolutely right. It, we, we just think it's unfair for, for, you to, for you to do that. But and, and, and honestly, since it's, since so many people are sensitive about it, and understandably so, when you you know when you when you realize, hey, I got I just I was considering raising my credit card limit, and I have this ding to my score. What the heck is that? So it's very understandable, and to the point where actually our our folks here in the sales team are are oftentimes telling folks up front, even unprompted, hey, just so you know, we use a soft credit pull, and and it really uh, makes people you know more comfortable proceeding with us for for a pre qualification evaluation. But taking a step back, so that's you know you know we figure out the, you know their their credit profile, like I mentioned. Uh, taking a t- step back to the pre-qualification itself. So that's one aspect. We, I mentioned, you know, your production capability. We understand that, you know, generally based on the uh, the income that you produced uh, in the last year. We, we, like I said, we understand your your personal financial situation. I can, I can we can certainly talk more about what it takes to qualify for a practice if you if you would like to do that, George. Uh, but in addition to that, so, so production, cash, and and credit. Really, those are the things that it comes down to. Uh, as as a person when you when you as a buyer rather when you're looking to buy a practice and then of course if you do have if you do know have a target practice in mind we we ask you what size of an acquisition it is because maybe you could be totally qualified to be buying a, a practice that's in the five to seven hundred thousand dollar range uh, but perhaps not for a three million dollar practice that takes you know somebody with um, some pretty special production capabilities and, and some more some more cash in the bank but the point point is at the end of the day we're evaluating these things and also some very very little things like your healthcare license, your, the status of that. We're, uh, we're figuring out whether or not you're a US, U.S. citizen or permanent resident, which is going to be a requirement across the board for lenders. So all these little things that are really easy to collect, we get out of the way first. And we know about everything that we need to know about you as, as a buyer in about 10 minutes. I think in our, for, in, our, in our full application, the only additional thing that you need to do as a buyer is upload your personal tax returns, uh, which you know can take about 10 seconds. You know, obviously, so now now we know that you're a qualified buyer and what size practice that you should be purchasing. And really, a lot of people talk about, you know, what should I do when I, what's the first thing I should do when I'm, when I'm trying to buy a practice? And we think it's that. Before you're targeting practices, you should know what you can buy. And, it, and, and maybe today it's not a fit, but we can also let you know what the things that you need to do to be in a position to buy, uh, you know, maybe you don't, you don't want to buy a $700,000 practice. You want to buy this beautiful $1.5 million practice that, uh, that you've identified we can get, tell you what you need to do to get there because usually the formula is painfully simple. Executing is executing is another thing that, that's a little bit harder. You know, becoming a bigger producer that might be easier said than done, but we can at least tell you very clearly, help you understand what you need to do to get there, so you don't go down the road of getting deep into maybe a negotiation with a seller only to find out that uh, the practice is currently beyond what you might be able to handle. Of course, there's the other side of the equation. There is that practice, and we need to evaluate that practice to formally approve somebody for a loan. But we're able to help buyers early on understand what they can what they can apply for and and, uh, and 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 do so with very very little time on their end. So if I'm understanding this, James, uh, you know my understanding and kind of what I've been telling people uh, when they contact me, and you know I think that maybe the more traditional model is you know a pre qualification is pretty meaningless without a practice. 
um, that you're actually acquiring because a lot of the a lot of the loan is dependent on the actual cash flow of the business that you're acquiring. But you guys mm -hmm. are you guys uh, will input. So I'm a buyer. I'll put in my application, and then you guys will get me like a production or a price range in which I'll qualify for anything up to whatever um, based on my personal information. Yes, we can absolutely do that, and it, and it is meaningful because when when you do find it when you find a practice. The Addy Valley, yes, you know, so are you approved for a loan? No, but is it meaningful? Yes, because you know what size practice you're looking for. And uh, evaluating a practice for, for a dental lender is, is not really the hardest thing to do on our end. We, we plug some numbers if it cash flows and, and you can perform the procedures that, that the seller did and, and you can perform the volume of procedures that the seller was performing. Dental loans are pretty easy at the end of the day. Usually that's going to be a great fit. There are some, there's some subjective nuance to it and, and all that, but you know, and you still you still added a lot of you still obtained a lot of value by getting that pre qualification early on, especially if you're you're not sure what you're looking for yet. Okay. So then let's talk briefly about, you know, we talked about it close to a year ago on the podcast. So I think it might be good for our listeners to review in, you know, your experience and with Lendever, you know, what kind of things are important for a buyer to be qualified for a loan, maybe a larger practice, to give themselves some more flexibility. Sure. Absolutely. So the great thing is it's pretty simple to understand. So number one, you know, pay your bills. So, so and that, that, you know, are you shooting for a very specific FICO score? No, uh, lenders are going to care more about the actual contents of your credit report. So make sure you're, you're making your payments on time, whether it's your student loans or if you're using credit cards, pay them off at the end of the month. You definitely don't want to be racking up credit card debt. That's going to, you know, the credit card, using a, a high amount of your, your credit card balance is going to drive your score down. So I'm not saying to shoot for a specific FICO score, but the, the key is to, to make your payments on time, pay your credit card balances off every month. If you're doing that, you're going to have a great FICO and every lender in the space is going to love you. Okay. That's really all there is there, there, there is about credit. If you, on, the other side is, is production. Make sure you get in a position where you can kind of show off what your skills are and what you can do. What we're typically going to do is take your income and multiply that by four. We're going to look at, you know, if there's 30% of productions, whatever you're getting paid, it just needs to add up to what you're trying to take on as a practitioner. So if there's, you know, five or $600,000 of doctor production, that's leaving the practice that, you know, being a seller, we need to make sure that you can take that on or at least have a plan to, to cover any Delta that's, that's there in the case of a larger practice. Maybe there's an associate there, maybe the seller's staying on. So the production capability is one side. Again, something that's very actionable, something that you guys can really understand and, and do something about. The other thing is putting some cash in the bank. A very common thing that, I think it, what we'll hear from corporate dentistry too is, hey, you're a student loan, so you can't you can't be an owner yet. You need to work on paying those off, so you need to you need to be in corporate dentistry for a really long time until you pay those off. And that's just not the case. Uh, the best thing you can actually do is put some cash in the bank. And an ideal number for for cash in the bank is have 10% of the size of the practice, or, or as perhaps more specifically, the the uh, loan amount that you think you're going to be requesting to buy the practice. So. I don't know. You want to buy a you want to buy a practice for seven hundred thousand dollars and have you know fifty thousand dollars working capital. You should shoot to have seventy five thousand dollars in the bank. Do you have to get that to qualify for a loan in this industry? Absolutely not. There's a bunch of lenders that would that would do that, but that would finance that opportunity without ten percent liquidity. But that's an ideal number. And if you're if you're looking for something to shoot for, that's going to make every lender uh, be clamoring to work with you. Uh, that's a good number to look for. Those are you know it really those are the three things. That those are the things you can really do do something about. If if you're in dental school and you have an and you have an opportunity to realistically maybe not take on as much debt as, as you could, that that might help. If no lender is terrified of a specific number of student loans. You don't have to say like I need to keep my loans below whatever. It's just something to keep in mind that when you have the more student loans you have, it's ultimately something that we will factor into your global cash flow. So just having more of them means there's more work for the the, the income or the cash flow of the practice to do to support your life. That's all. It's not something to, to really freak out about or anything like that. Every, you know, everybody we were work with work, uh, work with has a lot of student loans. It's it's something that's very common. But you know, if, if you if you have the option of maybe whether it's a family member helping you out or or uh, maybe working a little bit more uh, on the side, not taking on the you know additional uh, grad plus loans that have really high rates, you, you know, something you might consider. But the really the really big things to focus on because everybody has student loans are, are those three I mentioned: credit, cash and production. Okay. So I appreciate you uh, kind of running through that for our audience who may have not listened to our other episodes. So, you know, going back to maybe the dental lending space as a whole, 
So you guys, you created your software, you have your dashboard, you have your, you know, improved systems, and you're able to speed up that process. Now, as a buyer, mm-hmm. you know, if I have some time, am I, you know, are you also, what is that efficiency providing for the buyer other than just getting approved faster? So like what else? Sure. So at, go ahead. Well, the, at, well, it, well at, the really interesting thing, we're going to, we'll, we'll go back to that question, but there's, there's another exa- uh, advantage to speed. As you know, it's very much a seller's market, uh, and especially in, in, the, in the large metropolitan areas of the United States currently. You have a lot of people buying to buy. So, you know, we do a lot of stuff in, in California, and there's sometimes four or five buyers looking at a specific practice. And getting, whether it's pre-qualified so that we can provide you a letter confirming your pre-qualification or even formally approved uh, early on, is a way to get into first place and get the practice of your dreams. We just, I just had this happen for a great client of ours in the last few days. She was in a, he was in a, a situation where there were four or five buyers. They liked him. He was in the top two. But we, we went ahead and we had him formally approved before anybody else could. And uh, it's really the reason right now that uh, he's, he's in first place in the practice and he's in closing. So I, I, I know I'm kind of harping on speed again, but I, I wanted to mention that one of the other advantages of the speed is it's not just the efficiency and, and, the, and the doctor's time being saved. It's also that you can, you can win. <laughs> you can get into first place on a practice you might not have otherwise uh, been able to do so on. I appreciate you saying that, you know, that in the show, we have like an intro and outro. And that was something when you had talked about efficiency and speed and saving the doctor's time, I was in the outro going to talk about and probably still will about how sure you're saving your time, but what's more important is getting this process done quickly. And there's a lot of benefit to closing fast and efficiently and getting approved fast and efficiently, you know, as I'm experiencing, it can really help things out. Absolutely. And, and, you know, when you, and, uh, and when you start adding up uh, what saving 10 to 15 hours of your time and your, and your closing uh, process means as well, that, that really adds up, especially for a big producer. That's a lot of money out the window uh, when you're sitting at a computer in the middle of your day instead of going and practicing. And in addition to that, it's not just being able to go practice and work. I think, I think there's also value in being able to focus on what should be the more attentive aspects of the transaction for the, for the doctor. And that is, you know, the purchase and sale agreement, making sure that you're getting together with your advisors and and understanding, you know, tax allocations and, and how, you know, how various structures might impact you. And there's a lot of money to be saved on that front too. A lot of people focus on their rate and their financing, which is of course very important, but you know, the, the tax allocations make a big deal too. Should I buy the AR? There's a lot of hard things to decide uh, in a transition and, and freeing yourself up to focus on that with your advisors, I think is also a very good thing. And uh, I think you bring up a good point. Now I'm going to maybe shift the question a little bit, but I'm going to talk about that same type of thing. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, shifting your focus towards the acquisition and not focusing so much on rate and terms. Obviously, they're important, but what other maybe contingencies or terms of a bank loan are important to a buyer other than just your your rate and your length of term? Sure. That's a very broad question, but but one with there's there, there's a lot of great answers. So, uh, well, number one, you want to be you want to make sure that you're working with a conventional lender if you can. And what, what I mean by conventional is, is not an SBA lender, because you talk about contingencies and, and terms and all that. If you get an SBA loan, you, you, you'll probably end up with a lien on your home. If you have one, it's probably going to take four months to close your loan because there's so much red tape because it is a government guaranteed loan. Uh, and your terms are going to be a lot worse. So that's something, you know, I think that's something most folks know. It's pro- it is worth mentioning. Um, you want to make sure you're focusing on, on you know, like, I, like I'm saying, conventional lenders and also healthcare specific ones. Because and, and again, we're getting into ter- I, I know your question was about terms, but I think I think it's important to focus on healthcare specific lenders because they know how to evaluate these deals. I mentioned peace of mind in our case. If you end up with a, a bank that's not normally doing these types of loans, you're gonna you might get some weird onerous term. They might ask for a lien on your home. That, that's the kind of thing that could happen. And uh, they they really value collateral, so they may not understand the transaction altogether. Okay, that makes sense. And I was going to ask you, so in terms of like, does this efficiency that you guys have, does it help you guys with rates and terms? You know, obviously that's, I, I, if I had yeah, to imagine, I, you know, that would be what matters most to buyers when comparing multiple banks. So how does that help you guys, the efficiency of the online system with your actual terms that you're able to offer? Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to talk about that. And then you did ask a question there where you said, Hey, you know, what, what, what other things do matter outside of rates and terms? And, uh, we're going to get into that. By the way, I'm in downtown San Francisco. If you're hearing sirens behind me, I promise you I'm not getting arrested. There's a bunch of fire trucks that like to drive around, it seems like, in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, but first, towards your question about how are we able to, to provide lower-cost financing and 
and provide folks great rates. Um, number one is because we make things more efficient. Our, our software enables not just borrowers to, and, and their advisors who are helping with loans be more efficient. It allows us to do that as well. And because we're able to do things more efficiently and we're a digital organization, we don't have branches. You know, this isn't a brick and mortar overhead model like a bank with all kinds of branches. We're able to save a ton of money and it really, it's boiled down to, to lower rates and uh, in addition to the faster funding as well. And then, you know, so, so, you know, we have great rates, all that, and that, that matters a ton. And, and it's, it, it's a really wonderful virtuous cycle. And, and, and we think it's going to continue to do that as we get more efficient, as our software gets better, as our team, you know, gets better because of the software, we're going to continue lowering those rates and passing on the cost of the borrower. But yeah, like you mentioned, there are other aspects to, to rates and terms that, that do matter. For one, do you want to do a 10-year loan or do you want to do a 15-year loan? You know, the biggest factor in the amount of interest that you're going to repay on a loan, you know, assuming we're in, we're, we're in a kind of a reasonable range of differences on rate, is actually going to be time more so than the rate. So you know, an, an interest rate of 4.5% over 15 years versus interest rate of 4.6% over 10 years, you're actually going to pay quite a bit more off in the first scenario that I just described in the latter. And then, you know, talking about different lengths of terms and all that, the other thing to think about is do I want, you know, sometimes lower payments are great and it's worth the extra interest uh, repayment. Is it, it's, it might be nice paying $6,000 a month instead of $9,000 a month. There are other things that lenders in this space can offer, including ourselves, uh, like interest only payments to ease the transition when you're breaking into ownership. That, so instead of a $8,000 payment, that's including the principal out of the gate, you're paying interest only. And, and, and it's, probably going to be around two or $3,000. You can do deferred payments with uh, several lenders uh, in the dental space for, you know, maybe three months or six months, you're doing $100 payments or, or, or no payments at all. But that, that, there's a cost to that. If you're, if you're deferring your payments and accepting a longer term, you're, you're repaying a little bit of interest over time. So that's why we think it's really key for hopefully your lender is explaining the pros and cons of these different structures to you, but also to surround yourself with a team of really great advisors, a good CPA, is going to know everything I'm, I just mentioned front and back. And he's, none of this is rocket science. These doc, what you doctors are doing for a living is far more complicated than what this is really arithmetic. It's not even algebra at the end of the day, but it, it's a little confusing if you don't see it every day. So investing in, in a great team that, that is doing hundreds of transactions a year and can look at this and understand very quickly and explain to you very clearly, you know, the pros and cons of, of, of different structures is going to help you make a, a much more informed decision. As you've probably noticed from the length of this season, acquiring a practice can be stressful. One of the biggest concerns facing new owners is what technology will they need in the practice to be successful? What will the new office look like to patients? Is it time for an upgrade? Should I keep the old chairs, the developing rooms, or the worn out carpet in the hallways? Whether you need to upgrade the equipment or totally redesign your office, Dental Planet is here to help. Dental Planet provides affordable, comprehensive services that simplify your expansion or renovation process while dramatically reducing your ROI by keeping costs low. Dental Planet can reduce your equipment costs by up to 60 to 40%. They have new and certified pre-owned digital imaging systems available as well. If you need to add operatories, complete two operatory packages start from $36,000. With multiple financing sources available, this makes Dental Planet even more affordable. All products include a warranty backed by a nationwide network of service providers. See how easy and affordable upgrading, replacing, or expanding can be when you team up with Dental Planet. Just mention shared practices to receive an additional discount on top of their already low prices. Learn more at dentalplanet.com. I'll leave a link in the show notes. That's D E N T A L P L A N E T.com. Again, mention shared practices to receive an additional discount on top of their already low prices. So James, I got to ask, you know, in your, by the way, have I given you a chance to answer all the questions? I kind of threw like a lot of questions at you and I want to make sure you had a chance to answer all of them before I change topics a little bit. No, no, I, I, that, that was great. I appreciate you letting me kind of ramble around there, but no, absolutely. Thank you. So, good. you know, you guys are a tech startup, right? I mean, at the, at your core, you're a tech startup in the lending space. And so, you know, I'm assuming you get funding and then you use that funding to fund acquisitions for other people. So I'm I'm kind of seeing that you guys are going to need more funding in the future if you haven't, you know, so is this like a, at what point are you no longer dependent on outside funding to fund your loans? I'm just curious. That's a really great question. I'll, I'll kind of take a step back. 
talk a little bit about our business model and also about a really sort of landmark deal um, that, that took place uh, between us and First Internet Bank last year. Um, so last year, in, in Q3 of last year, we landed a deal with a bank called First Internet Bank, and, and they're really great for us because you know, they're founded by a CEO named David Becker, who's you know, got a tech background, a software background. He's a, tr- a tremendously visionary uh, kind of person to, to deal with, and, and his team has been great to deal with. And uh, they invested $600 million in, in our loans, which I believe is a really landmark thing. I don't, I don't think there has been any kind of investment like that in the healthcare space to provide financing to, to professionals. So, so that was really a landmark thing that was exciting. And, uh, so, and, and that's a substantial commitment. That means we're going to be around for a long, long time, at least five years. Uh, it means five also years. that, uh, <laughs> yep, yep, right, right. No, that's, that's, so, you know, 600 million is a, yeah, so, so it means we have you know, some, some great operational certainty. It also means that uh, we were able to lower our rates substantially uh, for customers. We have some of, if not the best rates in the industry right now. And, and yes, but absolutely, we're gonna, we, we're, we have some other great commitments that we're lining up currently. Um, but the, 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 the need for capital from, from our model, uh, from, for our structure, is never going to go away because we're not a bank. We don't borrow, borrow from the Fed. There will always be investors in our loans. And uh, so, so, yes, we are using... We are we are always uh, you know utilizing the capital usually at banks it could be large insurance companies that invest in our loans as well but that's something that's just a little bit different of a structure you know banks are always raising money too but the advantage is there they get to, they get to borrow from the from the Fed and and lend based on some of the deposits that they have uh, as well too so a very different kind of I guess you could call it capital market structure you know the pros obviously is, is access to capital is easier for a bank and, and you know, cheaper as well typically um, the advantages for us is we are more nimble. You know, we're, we're, we're less, not, not that we aren't regulated by, by any means, we are a licensed lender, uh, but we're able to be more, le- more nimble because we don't have a, a bank charter and we can improve our process more consistently and all that. So there's a bit of a trade-off between the two models for sure, but if your goal is innovation and improvement of, of process, it's really necessary to, to model it the way that we have. That's pretty sweet. And I think, uh, wow, I, I had no idea. I mean, obviously, you know, I think a lot of the things we're talking about I had no idea about. But you know that that congratulations to you guys for landing that huge deal. That's awesome. Thank you. It was it was really exciting and a uh, a true team effort. Uh, we have a lot of incredible people around here. Dan and I always joke about uh, how all these great people signed up to work with us, and you know it's just a privilege every day. And so you know what, so what is going to be driving? So I'm assuming what what kind of year over year growth have you guys been having? You know you guys are relatively new, but you're kind of gaining speed quickly. Yeah, so so let me take a step back. So I, I would say now, right now, we are the probably the third largest lender on the West Coast. And what this investment from First Internet Bank allows us to do is, I think, become the third largest lender throughout the United States. And uh, the two, you know, sort of big gorillas in the room, I guess, if, if you will, are our Bank of America and, and Wells Fargo. We could, we think we could be number three to them potentially by the end of this year. Uh, that's what this that allows us to do. We've actually brought in, uh, we, we, we just sent out a press release. We brought in an absolute top performer from, from Wells Fargo named Morgan Stump, who's been a, a true mainstay there in, in the face of their sales team for you know, a really long time. So we're now able, you know, in addition to you know, just having the capital behind us, but also national coverage, we're going to continue adding great people like Morgan and who, who have wonderful relationships in, this, in, in, in the dental space, has, you know, have provided DE. Uh, presentations for many, many years and, and have the respect of the industry as a whole. Um, we're going to continue uh, bringing on those types of folks. That's what this commitment enables us to do and have the comfort that we're going to know that we can execute on, on, on all the uh, wonderful opportunities that, are, that we bring our way. But our goal now is, is to, to hire the very best sales team in, in, in the industry. Some of that is going to involve uh, some folks moving over to us from, from our competitors, but we're also uh, kind of bringing people through the farm system here at Lendever. And, and I, I really like doing it that way for where folks kind of learn it to lend every way all the way through. But there's great people in the industry. We're bringing great people in as well. But it's pretty incredible, the growth that we're already experiencing. It's, it's, it's like 100% year over year, and it, it, it's pretty incredible. So, so yeah, our, our goal is, is our lofty. We'd like to be the third largest lender in the space by the end of this year. It's, that's quite attainable based on, on the track that we're on right now. Uh, and, and, of course, in a few years, we'd like to, we'd like to become the big grill in the space and, and – be serving more uh, dentists and also veterinarians as well. We serve that space as well than, than any other lender. You know, I think given, you know, what I know about you guys and maybe the trajectory and the changing of the lending space, you know, with companies like SoFi that you had talked about and whatnot, yeah, I think everything's just moving this way. And 
I can say, you know, uh, you gave me a little tour of your software, and I was extremely impressed. Um, it's definitely a sleek and smooth interface, and uh, I, I, I impress on our listeners a lot of the issues James is talking about with uh, the lending space as a whole. I, I don't necessarily think I totally realized until I started helping out a lot of buyers and going through the process myself. You start to realize, you know, like this could be done differently. And I, I was really excited to hear about what you guys are doing, and I thought it was really awesome. And so uh, do you have any advice um, as we kind of close off the interview for our listeners here um, as they are in the process yeah, of getting I, I, into I ownership? Oh, in the process of getting into ownership? What I, my advice would be to sur- sur- uh, surround yourself with, with great advisors and delegate the business portion of what you're doing. And, you know, unless you have a substantial business background yourself, it's a very small investment um, for a heck, not just peace of mind, but it's going to save you so much money and your practice is going to run so much better. I, I really think whether it's a dental specific CPA or, or management consultant uh, or attorney, that's absolutely the, the thing that I would do. One thing I would say is when you, you know, when you were talking to us, you mentioned the software and I'm, I'm really grateful and appreciative of the nice things that you say about that. It was, it was really hard to build it. And in many ways, it's, it's the hardest thing of what we're doing, but I do want to remind everybody out there that, you know, just because this is a technology service or tech and we're a technology lender, we, we're using this, not, not, we're not eliminating the personal uh, side of what we're doing. We think this actually allows us to be more personal. Yeah, you get to go pre-qualify watching popcorn in a movie uh, at 9 p.m., but everybody's, everybody that's making a million-dollar decision is going to want to talk to somebody that's smart uh, at some point. And by, you know, because we're not bogged down in the weeds and we're, we have this wonderful team here, when you do get somebody on the phone and you're talking about you know, your application and, and, or your options when we ultimately approve you, you're going to, you're going to really feel like you've, you've been encountering a, a tremendous service. So I just wanted to let people know that, yeah, yeah, we're tech and, and that's all, cr- that's all cool and great and, and all that. But at the, at the end of the day, we're trying to be more personal than the status. Awesome. And uh, I really appreciate your time, James. I think you guys are doing something really awesome. And we'll go ahead and leave a link in the description for anybody who wants to check out Lendever. We'll have a description or a link in the description below. So I appreciate your time, James, and I look forward to seeing you guys grow. Thanks for having me, George. I I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful evening and look forward to staying in touch. Will do. Well, I hope you guys really enjoyed that episode. I know I did. I had a lot of fun interviewing him and I I, I think he's just very, um, you know, sure of what they're doing. And I think with lending in general, I think in my mind, the things that are most important are the things that they are doing very well. And I've always talked to people, people always ask me, you know, what do you look for in a bank? What kind of stuff do you want to see? And for me, it's all about process. And in the past, you know, banks, it's so dependent on your banker, right? The individual who's doing the transaction with you and for you is the one who's going to be dictating, you know, do they have all the information they need? Do you have everything that the underwriters are going to need so there's not a hang up later in the deal? Because really with lending, and it's almost like lending, and we talk about real estate on the podcast, those are like the two areas that you don't need to go like there's they're not like it's not going to set you apart like having a great lender but it can really cause you a lot of problems if things don't go well so i think the fact that they're very efficient and it's a very smooth process is important because it won't hold you up in the end you know think about it if it takes you weeks to get approved you know closing in and of itself is a long process as well and that's not the kind of stress you want to have in the middle of or towards the end of your acquisition process but I'm really happy James made another point about the efficiency and the uh, smoothness of the whole process is that, you know, in competitive markets, you know, if you're if you're looking to buy a practice in a metro area, being approved for financing quickly, efficiently and being approved is going to be in the broker's favor. Um, And, you know, having the broker like you or want to work with you because you're, you know, approved quickly is going to be in your best interest. And so a lot of what we talk about in the podcast as it relates to brokers is the fact that they control a lot of the deal. And so being with a lender that'll get you done and approved quickly um, is going to be essential in your ability to get practices that are desirable, which ultimately is the kind of practices that you want to be buying. And so I think that's really awesome. Um, Another thing that I I jotted down on my notes was the soft pull. I, I, you know, I don't like hard pulls on my credit in general. And so I think that's nice that they do a soft pull. Um, I, I honestly had never heard of that. And he said they're the only people who do it, but I just think that's very interesting. And, um, I thought that was worth noting as well. And he, he seemed to explain in the episodes, I won't go through that. And then the last thing that I really noticed from that episode was, um, they offer, you know, multiple payment options. And one thing that I think would be nice, uh, entering ownership, like, like when you do a startup and we'll talk about it in the next season, you know, you have interest only payments for so many months and it's nice to have the cash flow, um, when you're early in ownership, you know, getting a majority of your income. 
And then, you know, as the practice, as you become more secure in the income from that practice, uh, then, you know, have, taking on a bigger loan payment is, is more maybe palatable to, to your peace of mind or whatever it may be. But the fact that they offer interest only payments, um, for the first, whatever, however months you want to do it, I think that's really awesome. And, um, you know, going into my acquisition process, that would be something that I would, you know, like to see. I probably won't see it, but that is something that I would, I, I think that'd be a benefit. And the few months of not paying principal, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference in the 10 year, 15 year loan. But I think the initial months of ownership where you're a little bit nervous about the whole, you know, I think there's, there's a part of you that may be a little anxious, like, are people going to keep coming? Am I going to keep, you know, up what they're doing? And so having um, the banknote be palatable and, uh, you know, much smaller payment, I think would be in every buyer's, you know, best interest. So that, that was my thoughts. And I, I really enjoyed the episode. I hope you guys did too. I think uh, James did a great job and uh, what they're doing is very interesting and I honestly think they're going to explode. Uh, I am, I truly do. I think that they, what they're doing is really, really good and their process is done very well and I think that shows in their growth and um, the fact that they had gotten all kinds of funding. So I think that's awesome and I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and then next week you'll hear uh, with from me and my co-host Jonas Ashbaugh, uh, Dr. Jonas Ashbaugh from Jacksonville and we'll talk about startups. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next week. And uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with me um, as I do this solo episode. Um, and then next week, we'll pick it up with uh, me and Jonas. All right, guys, I'll see you next time on the Shared Practices Podcast.